Okay, can everybody hear me? I think I will get us started. Yeah. Great. Apologies if there was a slight delay there. I think my uh, Zoom had a little, a little bit of a problem. But thank you very much, everyone, for joining this Escape GPR webinar on crisis communications best practices for cybersecurity companies. So for those of you who aren't familiar with me, I'm Connor Heslin. I'm an account director at Eskenzi PR. And for those of you unfamiliar with Eskenzi, we are a dedicated cybersecurity and technology PR agency with a UK, US, France and Germany presence. Um, and over the course of our 35 or of our 30 year history, we have helped dozens of security companies with their PR, including taking 35 companies through IPO or acquisitions worth over 30 billion. In addition to this, we've been advising companies from across the diverse spectrum of cybersecurity on the best, met best methods to deal with the crisis and how to prepare communication strategies which can stop a crisis from spiraling from something bad into something more existential. So the range of issues that can facilitate a crisis scenario at cybersecurity companies are myriad. There's you know, companies in our space who are not immune to the traditional crises that can befall a organizations such as a high profile employee or leadership scandal but the ones that we're going to be focusing on today are the ones that are more sort of associated with the cybersecurity space and the sensitive and often murky nature of the industry which does mean there are specific crisis scenarios for which we must prepare so things like data breaches insider threats outages such as the recent one that everyone will be aware of and falling foul of global compliance or regulatory frameworks are just some of the areas that cybersecurity companies must prepare for a potential crisis. Failing to prepare for these issues can mean that organizations in the thick of it lose control of any media narratives surrounding the issue and this crisis conspiring to something more substantial, potentially derailing business operations and more importantly, trust in the brand. As such, we wanted to host a webinar for cybersecurity leaders, communications and legal professionals as a wide ranging exploration of how communication should be handled by cybersecurity companies to ensure that if they find themselves in a crisis, their legal and communication strategies can minimize any damage. We're lucky enough to be joined by a fantastic panel of speakers who I'm delighted to introduce you today. And we will also have time for audience questions at the end. So please do write those in the chat. To cover the legal side of things, I'm joined by Jonathan Armstrong, who is a partner at Punter Southwell Law. Jonathan's professional practice includes advising organisations on risk and compliance across Europe, including handling legal matters in more than 60 countries, covering a wide range of compliance issues, including making one of the first GDPR data breach reports on behalf of a lawyer in the UK who had compromised sensitive personal data. He has been particularly active advising clients on the response to GDPR and conducted a wide range of investigations of various shapes and sizes, including for Fortune 250 organizations and household names. So thank you for joining us, Jonathan. Uh, joining Jonathan to provide the internal comms perspective is Kathy Watman, who is the Senior Vice President of Public Relations at Know Before, an integrated security awareness training and simulated phishing platform. With several decades of experience in the industry, Kathy is a trusted thought leader and PR and marketing executive, specializing in marketing, consulting, strategy and communications, public relations, organizational training and market research. So thank you very much for joining us, Kathy. And last but not least, we are joined by, to provide the external communications perspective, Eskenzi PR co-founder Neil Stinchcomb, who brings 30 years of experience in building successful brands in fast-moving technology markets, implementing successful go-to-market strategies, and advising extensively on both day-to-day -day communication strategies and crisis communication scenarios. So it's great to have you all with us, and thank you all for joining. So to begin, I would like to ask, you know, a very sort of rudimentary question, which I think will set the tone for the rest of the conversation, which is how important is crisis communications for cybersecurity companies? So I don't know if you wanted to get us started on that one, Cathy. Sure. It's a critical activity that you have to do. You can't ignore it. It's you, you must stay involved in communications with with your audiences, whether it be customers, prospects, um, media, what have you, but you have to have some, some some sort of crisis communications activity or plan in place. It's very important. If you don't, don't have anything to up there. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I, I definitely agree. And I think what has changed in the last three or four years is the pace of social media, the interest of regulators and litigation risk. And those three combined, you know, clearly Neil will talk about this uh, more than I can. But we've seen uh, journalists in mainstream media under pressure to create more stories. So that means they'll often recycle a crisis. We see social media bloggers get involved, uh, particularly in things like data breaches. You know, we've seen that with some of the big payroll data breaches. We've seen regulators monitor things like social media and ask questions that, you know, is common with GDPR regulators, for example. And then we see litigation as well. So, as you said, there have been uh, very high profile uh, IT failures and a hacking incidents this year, and litigation has almost always followed. It's litigation from the people affected, litigation from customers, and litigation, if you're a publicly listed entity, from shareholders as well that think that the value of the shares has dropped because you didn't respond to the crisis well enough. So you hit on all sides, really, I think. And I think that that has definitely accelerated over the past three or four years, I'd say. Yeah, and to follow on from what, both what Kathy and Jonathan have said, I think most people in the cybersecurity world know it's not a case of if something will happen, an incident, and we always refer to it as an incident, not a breach, because as soon as you say the word breach, you have to inform the regulators, so you're very careful in the language you use, but also um, the, the impact of it is going to be quite great. And so I think the legal aspects had to be thought through, the technical aspects of how the incident is handled and the communication aspects. And if you don't have a plan and you don't haven't used that plan in the sense of testing it and making sure everyone is, knows how to handle it, because not every incident is going to happen in the nine to five working day. Probably you're going to get attacked when most people are asleep. When, when they say a nation state, if you have a nation state exact for example, from somewhere like North Korea, they're probably going to attack you in their time zone. Or when China has lunch, you'll see all of a sudden all the attacks die down, all the activity. So don't assume it's going to happen in your normal nine to five. And then knowing how you're going to respond, who is going to respond, and what you're going to say, you can prepare in advance. So you need to prepare these things and then test them. And one thing you will notice that is people that handle these incidents well, their share price can actually go up. People that handle these incidents badly, the board gets fired and the share price goes down. So plan for these things to happen and plan to handle it in the correct way. Yeah, I think that's really important to, to mention straight off the bat is that the planning is going to be crucial and it's going to be a recurring thing throughout the conversation. Um, Moving on to another question I'd love all of your perspectives on is something I'm personally interested in. It's kind of identifying a crisis in its embryonic stage. So when a lot of the people that are listening now and, you know, even some of the people on this call hear about a, a crisis situation from a cyber perspective, it tends to be once the sort of horse is bolted effectively. So we read about it in the press and all of that kind of stuff. But I'd be interested, Jonathan, maybe you can start us off on this one on what what are the warning signs for you of a, a sort of embryonic cyber crisis? Is it just getting kind of panic phone calls or do you see something from retained clients, et cetera, that looks differently? I'd be interested to hear your perspective on that and then and then Neil and Cathy. Yeah, I, th I think it's all of those things. I mean, obviously, astute uh, clients will monitor things like social media. They'll monitor things like subject access requests coming in, because that can often be a sign that there's some crisis heading your way. They'll uh, tell employees that they want to hear from them early, not late. If it is a data breach, they'll have a sort of no blame culture on telling uh, people to report stuff. And I think one of the important things they'll also do is they'll have it a bit like a you know, when whenever we stay in a hotel, on the back of the door, it says, if you smell fire, raise the alarm and get out of there. Um, and we need that mentality with crises, with data breaches. Sometimes people delay reporting an incident because human nature is we like to work out what it is and find a solution, particularly if we're reporting to somebody more senior than us. We like to say, this thing happened. Here's the fix. Let's do it. 
But oftentimes with things like data breaches on most crises, you don't have that luxury of working out. If it's a data breach, as Neil said, you're likely to have to report it in 72 hours. People often discover breaches when they're already, uh, let's say, 36 hours in, so your time's really compressed. We need to say to people that the same as a fire alarm. It's not your job to work out what type of fire extinguisher, how many fire engines we need, whether they need to be people with breathing apparatus. Raise the alarm, get a grown-up to deal with it. And, and, and to Neil's point, we have to have a plan. We have to rehearse it. We have to rehearse the, the raising of the alarm. And a really petty minor thing but just because I've had it so many times, hard copies of plans. So many clients mm -hmm. that I've advised have had a ransomware attack. Then they've said, we've got a really great plan to respond to this, but we can't access the network because we've got a ransomware attack. If you've got a plan mm -hmm. to handle a ransomware attack and you should have one, then it needs to be hard copy. It needs to be with people at home if they work from home, et cetera, et cetera. The plan has to be easy to use can't be written by IT people usually, and, and you need to, to rehearse and improve it. Cool, that makes sense. Kathy, what's the first warning signs for you? Well, usually you get some sort of request. You either get social media commentary, you get requests from salespeople, you get media requests, you get some sort of inquiry, maybe from customers, um, there's there's always some sort of uh, rumor line that pops up that you can get a hold of if you're paying attention. Um, you you may or may not have dedicated people who look for crisis management indications or monitor that, but the infosec or IT may come across something too. The real critical point is picking people who can jump in when something occurs. You can't wait until it occurs to figure out who's gonna be your team. And you also need a backup because some people might be on vacation, they may be on leave. Um, so if you don't have an alternate in place and some sort of really dedicated plan of what to do, who to go to, how to contact them, you could end up in trouble. So in terms of monitoring and looking for potential it's really multi you have to have multiple channels of communication open that you look at on a regular basis sure i think that makes sense neil anything else to add in terms of crisis in the embryonic stage yeah i, I think operating a no-blame culture as i think jonathan and kathy have both said is very important so people feel able to report right to the top if they need to and having a clear reporting structure because as as, as i think you both said the, the request could come through to the help desk, it could come through to the press office, it could come through to anybody in the company if it's an external source. I mean, I've had clients where I've had to pick up a phone call to a national journalist, um, one of the actually most popular publications in the world with over 600 million readers and try and defuse the situation. That is not the best place to be handling a crisis from, but you have to think on your feet. Um, better to have someone internal have the ability to see, okay, we're seeing a lot of traffic, this kind of, when we see this kind of traffic in our network, there's a problem. Or if we see this kind of stuff on the dark web, there's a problem. So having those smart technical people to look for, like, I guess, in early indicators of there being an issue, but making sure that everyone knows what to look for, but in their different, if each department, in their department, what would be the signs that there's something going wrong? And then who do they notify? And then how to escalate it because you don't immediately want to say to the CEO, I think someone's had a firewall breach isn't necessarily the reason for a Fortune 100 CEO to be woken at midnight. So you've got to work out, is this a serious incident? Do we need to escalate it? Who do we escalate it to? What's the process? Mm. And then to handle it in the correct way. And of course, everyone yeah. could be a reporter on social because as Jonathan mentioned, monitoring social and Kathy mentioned monitoring social anything could break on social it may not even be true and of course with all these ai techniques coming out now with image manipulation a lot of incidents could not be true and so how do you break that down dispute it handle it in that situation where someone's puts something on social which is not even true or it is true but you investigate it and it's all about buying time with legitimate journalists 
and reporting with them and giving them the facts. And when, if you're going to give them the facts and you give them a deadline, you come back to them and meet your deadline. It's all about mm. building trust with the journalists, with the social media, with your clients, with your suppliers, with every, with their employees as well. Make sure internal communications match your external comms. Yeah. So I think we kind of touched on a lot of this and that's really interesting to hear that having your team in place is going to be one of the best ways effectively to make sure that a crisis is caught in the embryonic stage is knowing that chain of command. So that's kind of my next question is, talk to me about how you kind of develop that chain of command. So what areas of the business should it be involved in developing a crisis comm strategy and at what point in that crisis? I mean, obviously we've got two esteemed members of the sort of internal teams and external teams that we would include, but I'd love your perspective. Maybe if you want to start with this one, Kathy, on on building that crisis comms sort of team and who's there first, who gets brought in later, et cetera. It really depends on what the scenario is, but minimally you should have someone from communications, someone who is involved with customer communications, legal, at which is a critical point, and someone from either info security or IT, if you don't have a dedicated mm -hmm. InfoSec team, those are absolute minimum. And then sure. there you would have to be able to investigate what kind of situation is it, and then quickly ad address. Usually you have some sort of prepared draft communications of what do you say to whom, um, you may have to pull in HR if it's an internal situation. Um, there are various, it really depends on the scenario. And so you have to kind of plan for different types of scenarios, but you still have your, your basics, which are always have a plan, investigate, get specifics, get the facts, get the data, make sure you work out and notify who is involved and who's affected. And those, those are the critical components. And then you have your internal and external audiences. You have staff, you have executives, you have, depending on the size of your organization, you may have multiple offices. And of course you have press and social media. And press, mm -hmm. social media should be, any responses should be uh, consistent. Mm -hmm. Jonathan, anything to add there in terms of your key team? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think I think Kathy's Kathy's definitely right. If you're a listed entity, you probably need to include somebody from investor relations or somebody who does your stock exchange filings as well. We've had a warning, particularly in the US, that data breaches are reportable under what's called a 10K. So if you're a listed entity, you'll need to look at that very early on. Uh, I would say this, wouldn't I? Uh, you Lawyers need to be heavily involved in this. We've had a case in Australia recently where the CEO briefed the media. They basically had a report into the incident. You'll not nearly always want to keep that under uh, legal privilege if you can because mm -hmm. of the litigation risk. And the CEO effectively compromised that risk by going to a press conference and saying, yeah, 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 we've got a report and I'll come back and share highlights for that report. So when they tried to get into the heat of the litigation, and this is millions of people potentially in a class suing them, they then tried to row back, if you like, and say, yeah, the report was for uh, legal purposes, but mm -hmm. the fact that the CEO had briefed and said, we're going to share elements of that report, waived privilege. So you'll need to look at that particularly. That's quite a specialist area. You'll need also to look at the wording. So I think a knee-jerk reaction for people who aren't familiar in this space is to almost big up the attack. And quite often people will say, oh, it's a sophisticated nation state attack on us. Mm -hmm. And you somehow think, well, that's more excusable because we've said that. Those words alone may have invalidated your insurance policy. So if you have mm -hmm. cyber liability in place, you know, briefing wrongly is a pretty a critical mistake. So I'm not a fan of lawyers telling people to say nothing. I think nearly always you have to say something. I think Kathy's right, it should be pre prepared. For most of our clients, when we're involved, we try and uh, 
uh, usually get them to what we call change the default settings. So pre-agree a press release, have legal uh, agree that in advance, you know, slot in the bits about this particular crisis, but make sure that you've got wording that you're happy with. And your default setting might be, this will go within one hour unless somebody stops it. Because we've seen a lot of cases where you're still trying to agree where the dots should go and where the whether the T should be crossed. And people, mm -hmm. because they, in a crisis, people behave differently. And a lot of them are risk averse and think if we say nothing, we're in a better shape. Nearly always that's wrong. And they also try and get into pernickety detail, like phraseology, almost to avoid action. So you've got to deal with that, all of that stuff before the crisis hits if you're going to do it well because as neil rightly says you should always be thinking when not if statistically you are going to be involved in a crisis you are going to be involved in a data mm -hmm. breach uh, every corporation has two or three a year invest the time and effort in making sure you get that right yeah i think that's really spot on um Neil, anything to add in terms of your anybody you want to add to that team or any examples of companies maybe that you can think of without naming any names who've had that team in place and done well on that subject? I think it's, yeah, I won't mention specific companies because I don't really think it's fair to, but I think no, no. there is a phrase I always use, there but for the grace of God go I. So whenever we tell our clients to talk about anything, just imagine it's you and what you would like someone to say about what happened to your company. And then that is the tone I always think a journalist should take when these because they haven't intentionally got breached. <laughs> no company goes out and says, yeah, no, I want a hacker to hack me or I want a nation state to steal my secrets. They don't do that. So this is unfortunately someone bad doing it's a criminal. So they shouldn't, you don't criticize someone for being burgled. You don't criticize someone for being stabbed, you know, by a mad person. You know, you don't criticize someone being blown up by a bomb it's not their fault necessarily it's someone bad doing something bad and this is the situation we're in so it's very much a question i think of, of in dealing with this is having the right external advisors as well on tap ready to go like obviously legal to me is really important and also specific security people that know exactly we obviously Kathy has the luxury of having a brilliant team of cybersecurity people and fantastic cybersecurity company so they have those people internally Lots of other people don't have that luxury. So making sure you have a team of people that can come on, on site or go into the cloud and sort out and establish exactly what the facts are, which I think Kathy said very clearly, get the facts. Mm. Um, we'll come yeah. on to that in a minute. Uh, and then sure. obviously communications advice because we're not, it's not happy days. It's wonderful news. We've got a great product. Mm -hmm. This is like, if that something bad happen, the way you handle it is very different to most company news where you talk about something positive. This is handling an incident and you want to make sure you give people confidence in your company that you're going to do the right thing and you're trustworthy. Yeah, I think I, that's I think excellent that's, advice. Sorry, sorry, Connor, I was just no, going please, to say, I, I think that's a really, a really essential point that we should just focus on for another minute or so, if that's mm. okay. Um, good time comms and bad time comms, from my point of view, aren't the same. And um, without... Um, overpraising Neil. You need people like Neil in a crisis, not necessarily the in-house resource that you've got doing your day-to-day -day stuff. I can remember an incident where we knew it was likely to hit the press. We knew it was potentially um, terminal for the company if the allegations were true. And we briefed the head of, um, she was head of PR and marketing. And she said, right, I'll ring up all my sources, we'll get this in the papers tomorrow. We're saying, this is exactly what we don't mm -hmm. want. You know, we want to be reactive, we want to manage stuff when it goes in, but we're not going out to sell the story. And, she, uh, and her whole background was in, you know, selling good news. And mm -hmm. clearly, to state the obvious, you don't want to go out there and sell bad news. So sometimes it needs different techniques, different strategies, and it's not a place for the enthusiastic amateur. You'll need people like Neil who've been there, done it, got, got the T-shirt. Yeah. Exactly. No, that's really important to mention. One other thing to add is speed is essential. You can't wait. You can't wait till hours. You can't wait days. You have to have something in place within minutes. 
of, of being notified of something occurring. So whoever's on your team, um, it's really important that they know that it has to be handled quickly. You don't have Absolutely. Time. Yeah, I think that makes perfect sense as well. The speed's really important. Um, so it's kind of lead on from that kind of importance of moving quickly. I'd be interested to hear, Jonathan, as somebody who offers external advice on crisis comms and compliance scenarios, I'm interested to hear what sort of stage you tend to get contacted at and whether, in your opinion, that's the correct stage or whether people are, you know, getting in touch too too soon, too late, et cetera. When do you normally get the, the phone call when somebody's in a crisis scenario? And how would you like to see that adjusted for, you know, to manage expectations better for people? Yeah, I mean, Neil's right. The, from our point of view, crises don't often come in during office hours. I think that more than 50% of our data breaches, for example, come in Friday post 3 p.m. And that tends mm -hmm. to be quite challenging. If you've got to make reports in multiple jurisdictions, then oftentimes you're having to make them on a Saturday or a Sunday. Obviously, if you're having to make data breach reports, you may be having to make them in a different language. Uh, mm -hmm. I can remember, for example, last summer, I think, trying to get hold of an Italian lawyer to make a report for us. But it's this time last year. It's hot. They're at Lake Como. It's a Friday night. Um, without <laughs> telling tales out of school, try find a good Italian cyber lawyer who's sober on a Friday night in August. <laughs> uh, so you know, or in London. Yeah, <laughs> that's probably right. I think I've got a decent roller deck, but I think I was on about call twelve. So, so crises often come in at, at, at inconvenient hours. And if you read, you know, the Lazarus Heist, for example, or the BBC podcast, you'll know that some nation states do that deliberately because they get more of a run at, at, at systems when there's less people around. But even things like simple losses of laptop, address books, all that sort of stuff, quite often people will confess late on a Friday. Somehow they think it's better to, you know, absolve themselves uh, before the weekend. Um, lawyers, as a general rule, in my view, get involved too late. We have good clients who will tell us right at the start of an incident, and I think for the reasons I gave you before, things like privilege, things like tone, mm -hmm. it's important to, to to ring people up really early on. And if you've got good lawyers and a good relationship with lawyers, then um, then you know they're not going to charge you if it's a false alarm, or they're not going to charge you much. And you'll learn from from false alarms as well because you'll get the team together, you'll be able to dis to discuss stuff. So none of that is uh, should should be expensive. And you, and obviously the opposite is very expensive if you don't get it right, if you invalidate your insurance or, or whatever that might be. So that's a point I wanted to just quickly cover as well, actually, about you mentioned about nation state as a potential issue that could invalidate your insurance. Is there anything else? What's the worst thing? What shouldn't people say at the beginning of a crisis from a legal perspective? What would be the sort of thing that might send steam out of your ears if you heard a client say? I, I, I think. People who are um, who try and be over accurate is another issue that I've seen. You know, I know, for example, um, Talk Talk, for example. And if we're not naming names, then the the person who we'll all remember, you know, who starts off giving one number and then another number and then another number. Mm -hmm. I can remember my daughters at the time being teenagers say, um, well, you know, why don't they just get that? Um, poor crying lady off the TV. Um, you, if you're going to give a number, it has to be an accurate number and you have to stick to it. From my experience, even the best companies don't know the right number for things like number of people affected, type of data uh, compromised. They don't know that in the first 72 hours. So why would you guess? And to, to Neil's point, I think you've got to have a trust journey with the victims, with your shareholders, with your employees, with stakeholders. And nobody likes you being over ambitious with the numbers early on. I think people are more understanding if you say to them, uh, if it is true, there's law enforcement on the scene, 
trying to get to the bottom of exactly the result. Um, to Neil's point, we'll come back to you when we have more meaningful information. Mm -hmm. Meantime, identity theft's a risk. Here's what you can do about it, or, or, or whatever you're going to say to people. But don't pluck figures out of the air to say, oh, there's 10,000 people, now there's 100,000, now there's 97. You know, it's nearly always too early to say. Wait until it's right. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Um, it goes back to really, always, always go over the facts. Have the facts. Don't, Absolutely. Don't guesswork. Don't invent it. Well, that's another one I wanted. To, that's something I wanted to ask you about as well, Kathy. Is how that so how those facts and how you communicate this sort of situation changes depending on the kind of stakeholder you're talking about. As an internal kind of comms person, how different are you, how different is the communication with various stakeholders? If you're trying to communicate this to partners or to you know salespeople, customers, etc., how do you approach you know different language, different um, approaches for each different stakeholder that might be affected by a crisis? Well, you basically have, you gather all the information, you get the facts, you determine how it affects each of those different audiences. And that's that's kind of your framework that you use to brief them. It has to be based on how it affects them or the audiences mm. they might be dealing with. In our company, we have a policy of radical transparency amongst staff, and they're very well briefed on what's happening, what they can say, what they can't say, just so they have a clear understanding of an overall situation, good or bad. And you have to kind of gear your messaging toward what, what effect it has on them and what they should mm -hmm. be wary of or what they should be alert to. If it's a breach and it affects customers, then the customers would have to be communicated to but the sales teams, the marketing teams, customer success, those those um, staff would have to be briefed on what happened in terms of enough information so they understand it. Maybe not every single little detail because it, it wouldn't always be relevant, um, but how it affects their customers. And then you give actionable advice on what they can do to resolve it or what steps to take it always has to be actionable. You never want your audience to be left, now what do I do? I have information, but I have no clue what to do. So you have to give them some direction on what they should do and what steps to take, what they should be expecting as any sort of follow-up. Mm. And I guess that's you know really important for what the kind of information the company's putting out or socials, et cetera, is if you're you know, the normal rhythm of social media activity the uh, company might be doing is going to be drastically affected so all of those kind of stakeholders need to be involved and informed that you know normal sort of salesy type social posts or mailers all of those kind of things may need to be suspended for a little while um so that's really helpful to know thank you kathy mm -hmm. so uh an external perspective on kind of the communication of crisis so on social media or across different media channels neil what do you think is the kind of appropriate strategy for each particular stage of a crisis? So before or during a crisis is taking place and then in the kind of aftermath of a crisis, how might the comms strategy change as the crisis develops? Well, first of all, don't panic. <laughs> it sounds <laughs> obvious, but honestly, just make sure everyone's going to stay calm. Something bad's happened. We're going to get through this. We have a plan. We have a strategy. Everyone knows what they're doing, hopefully. <laughs> and so we're going to follow this plan and, and be prepared to be flexible because you're guaranteed that whatever you plan for, something else will also happen or be a, a slight variation to it. Um, and also, depending on where you're starting from, because you may be starting where someone internally has found something, you've acted appropriately, you've informed your, your, your customers in their appropriate way through their account managers. You've told your help desk what to expect. You've told the regulators in time. You've done everything correctly. You've had your legal advice. You've had your comms advice. You've been to everyone's aligned. Perfect. Or your national newspaper calls you up and says, hey, I just heard you've had a, your software is broken and someone's hacked into your cybersecurity software and your company's not worth anything anymore. What's your comment on that? So that there's two different scenarios of you know, something's really blown up and all of a sudden everyone's software stops working 
all around the world. So these different scenarios will require different approaches at each of these stages. Mm -hmm. But right through it, I think what you're trying to do is maintain trust mm. from your various yeah. stakeholders. And the stakeholders are your shareholders. They're your customers. They're your employees. They're the regulators, the government. You want to make sure that whoever you are representing in terms of making them feel better, making them feel happier at the situation, build trust with them and keep that communication. Make sure your internal communications are working well. When, as Kathy said, make sure everyone's talking to each other. Don't just give a briefing. Oh, we're going to bring another briefing on Friday. It's Monday. Like, who knows what's going to happen in the next five days? It needs to be like, have a wiki or something, some mm. or, or something that's a dynamic document that people can look at and say, okay, I know what's mm. happening. I can see the communications. So there's constantly being updated as you go through it. And when when you you've got through it, just make sure you kind of recap everyone. This is how we did. We, this is how we've handled the situation, and reassure people again. This is what we're now doing to rectify the situation. So if you need to put people back into the position before this happened, like customers, um, make sure you're going to do that and communicate that. So they go, okay, that something went wrong, but they've made it right for me, or they've done mm -hmm. something to make me feel better. It doesn't need to cost you money. It could just be something you've done, which some advice that helped them. You know, it doesn't always have to be like paying out money, or whatever. It can also be just making them feel confident you've handled it correctly and you put things in place that so doesn't happen again. Yeah, that's yeah. really important. I, um, I, 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 can I just pitch in on that? Sure. I, I think as well as that helping from a, a, a PR reputation point of view, I know that that helps with most regulators as well. So oftentimes we'll be doing the interaction with regulators as I say, 72 hour from incident time. Uh, and when I'm talking to regulators, I always want to say, and this is what we learned, and this is what we're fixing now. Mm -hmm. And some stuff is fixable within 72 hours. You know, if you've had a phishing attack, for example, and somebody in the business has clicked on a link they shouldn't have, it's relatively easy to do quick hit phishing training. You can do that within the 72 hour window, tell the regulator, this is what happened. Somebody clicked on a bad link. We've increased our training and, and, and we know that that's been a vulnerability and that's already fixed. Take people off the network, you know, take their access away until they've done that training. So it's always quite easy to find a quick fix that will go some of the way and your regulatory outcome will be materially better if you can be self-aware about what went wrong and fix it or at least be on the journey to fixing it by the time you have to make your report. Yeah, I think that's really important. So I think another question I'd really like to ask, and I think we'll start with you on this one, Kathy, as a result of kind of the experiences of, of recent weeks is, you know, we've talked a lot about the doom and gloom associated with a, a, a crisis incident, and rightly so, because they're likely to be quite stressful, but there are also you know, examples, which we'll hear about now, of crisis scenarios or scenarios that were less than favourable that have turned into things that are huge positives for the business. Um, and crisis scenarios can be, you know, switched into a positive thing. So I don't know, Kathy, whether you wanted to just talk us through a little bit the kind of uh, experience of Nova before in recent weeks and how you use that to your advantage. Sure. Well, we had, uh, we employed a North Korean hacker um, in case you haven't read mm -hmm. any hundreds of press articles on the subject. And what we did was we put out, we, first off, it was not a data breach. There was no mm -hmm. information that was taken or accessed um, What because of our hiring practices. What we did is we we had hired this, this guy who turned out to be, have, he used, deep fake technology he used like all kinds of tools to circumvent normal hiring and um, what we did is because of our policy of radical transparency our ceo thought this is a great example of how we can utilize this information and turn it into a teaching activity or a teachable moment because mm -hmm. that's what we do so he wrote a, a, a fantastic blog outlining actually what occurred and updated it a couple of times and we and put it out. And of course, we have um, six figures readership of, of our company blog. 
So it, it hit broadly right off the bat. And then we start getting media inquiries and we're still getting media inquiries to this day. Um, but what we decided to do is talk about what happened and how it happened. What we did, we caught it within 25 minutes. It happened at 9.30 p.m. on a Friday night. Uh, to your point, Jonathan, um, it never mm -hmm. happened during regular work hours. And you know, and what we did was we shut it down. Um, the person did not get access to any systems. What we do with new hires is they're segmented off until they go through basic training and the basic, no matter what position they're in. And the basic training consists of learning key terminology, learning the different systems that we use, like how, how do you send an email? <laughs> what do you do? What, you know, various platforms that we might do, uh, they go through their own cybersecurity training as part of the onboarding process. But within 25 minutes, of course, they weren't able to do much of that. And our InfoSec team was all over it, handled it immediately, shut it down, and looked at red flags that occurred. And so we were able to then use it to inform other companies. Um, mm -hmm. A couple of weeks ago at Black Hat, we ran into multiple companies who had done the same thing. And until we posted about it, they had no idea that this was a potential threat within their organization. So because we talked about it and made it known, they were able to weed that out within their own organizations. And in fact, we ran into one organization who hired the same guy. And so wow. it, it was, you know, it because we were doing a service and it took some, it took some, um, I'm looking for the right word for it, but <laughs> a bit of courage to be able to send that out and say, yeah, we have egg on our face. We train people, but if it happened to us, it could happen to you. And in fact, in many cases, it had happened. And then on well, that's the so important from a demystifying perspective, isn't it? Yeah. And I think being willing to um, share those kinds of instances with people, it, it makes it less... Uh, a lot less scary for organizations when they know this is it's not like neil said it's not if it's when and knowing what to do and how to be prepared what to look for and the more information you have the more causative you can be over a situation like that and the more helpful you can be to other organizations so Absolutely. that turned a funky situation into a really helpful one yeah Anything else to add, Jonathan O'Neill, on the subject of a crisis turned into a positive? I've had a good news story with uh, shoes, actually, not 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 a cyber breach, <laughs> uh, where a, a client had some very bad news about uh, uh, children's shoes that were allegedly uh, carcinogenic. I, I think they managed the recall really well. They trained people in the retail outlets incredibly well as well. They apologized early. They apologized, you know, authentically and sincerely. They gave people vouchers, um, which made things like returns easily trackable. Um, and, and they actually oddly turned a profit from the mm -hmm. incident because people would come in to use their voucher and then buy other stuff as well because of the way in which they felt they were handled. More recently, I've had a client who resold uh, a product that's been in the news uh, recently, um, which uh, has led to outages. And they uh, reached out to their customers. They'd only sold, I think, to nine customers. They'd resold this product. But they reached out to them, got ahead of the news, told them what this was likely to mean, you know, quick fixes, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and again, have have, have trended to, to, to positive reactions to that. Interestingly, on Neil's point there, but for the grace of God, we, we also did an exercise where we or, or a client reached out to employees after a data breach and the client was into measuring metrics and they tracked the exact words 
that the employees mm. said and 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 words like there but for the grace of god were tracked in those in in those sort of positive responses from employees so as a general rule if you if you treat people right i, I like uh, kathy's transparency approach as well then i think you can make a positive out of a crisis mm. I think we're going to leave some time for questions as well. So just one final, very quick thought from each of you on if there's one thing people should take away from our kind of crisis communications, best practices uh, conversation we've just had, what would that be? And I suspect you're all going to say a variation of the same thing, but I'd be interested to hear how you phrase it all in terms of what was the most important single thing people can take away from this, this conversation? Have a plan. Practice <laughs> Do a dry run so you know what you're getting into. Neil? I would say the same thing and make sure that everyone knows what part they have to play and also feel able to report things that have happened that they're suspicious of and don't not to be embarrassed. I mean, I've, I've sat in so many meetings in my career where I've thought, why isn't anyone asking that question? And I asked the question to go, that was a really good question. I wish I'd asked that. So I thought it was obvious to me. And then why isn't anybody else asking it? Because I'm a bit le left uh, left field. And they go, well, that's a really good question. This And this is, this is like, if something seems a bit odd, off, just report it to, yeah, to the, correct. your cyber team or your IT team and let them have the ability to answer it before it turns into something yeah. really Yeah, I mean, I, I'd say don't underestimate the source of the the sort of emotional side of it as well. I ha have had people, you know, the CEO of a, of a vendor of, of, of our client cry on the phone, you know, openly because of the, the, the stress of, of it. Mm -hmm. So don't underestimate the fact that people will be in a bad shape emotionally. These things do hit them. As a joke, this probably shows my age and uh, obscure music knowledge, but as a joke, I once said to a client that, that we called that the Chumba Wumba test. Uh, you know, everyone gets knocked down, but it's how you get back up again. And so, you know, do remember the Chumba Wumba test and when you're testing mm -hmm. your own processes, you know, take that on board as well. Sure. So that's really, really helpful. And thank you, everybody. Um, we have a few minutes for a couple of questions from our audience, so I will throw those across to our panel and see if anybody has any thoughts. But one which I think is really interesting and really important to mention is what would be your top tips for monitoring a potential crisis when your organisation isn't large enough to have a kind of dedicated crisis management team or, you know, retain cyber people, retain comms people, retain legal people, etc. Because small businesses are getting hit with cyber crimes just as regularly as large businesses, if not more. We know this to be the case. So I'd be really interested to hear how you think people should do this on a slightly thinner budget. Well, I just yeah. Keep... Yeah. You go ahead, Catherine. Okay, I think uh, most people don't have the luxury of having a dedicated crisis management team, even very large companies. It's, so it's usually an additional function that people have as part of their job. So um, I think each person within a company should be oriented towards reporting something that they see as odd. Like in the UK, when I visited the UK, you see a lot of signs see something say something um mm -hmm. something al along those lines where there is there is a place to report it to if, whether it's a simple email a message what have you just something that seems odd or looks weird or is very suspect have a place to report it to so that's for internal people for externally whoever's in charge of communications whether you're doing it yourself or you have PR firms or what have you, you have to have channels of communication that you regularly look at and you have to assess either you monitor the press, social media, look for places where your name shows up and just, you know, look, take a take Yeah, some that's a really important point. I think that the, I mean, I think when we were discussing this before our call, Jonathan, you mentioned that so many crises that you've had to deal with have been as a result of people who failed to check emails effectively. Mm. I, th I think that's right. I think you can do you 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 can do some 
quick fixy type things that aren't perfect. But if you're on a budget, you know, setting a Google alert against your name, your company's name might, might tell you in advance. We've had a number of data breaches picked up that way by clients. Uh, for the rehearsal thing, um, in the past, we've done courses where a number of organizations get to rehearse alongside each other. So you would buy two or three or four places at, at a public event, compete with other other uh, corporations in a safe setting. I know, Neil, we've talked about maybe doing one safe people want to email afterwards and say they'd be interested in that, then then, yeah, then maybe that's it. something we'll, we'll do together. Um, but there are low cost ways of, of doing it. Um, but having said all of that, again, if you're a listed entity, then you will be expected to put money behind this. You know, we are seeing an increasing concentration on put on personal liability for individuals and regulators don't, give you that much latitude for we're a startup, we're early stage business, we didn't have the budget. Uh, no. So you will need to resource this properly and and regulators will regard it as a priority, particularly if you've had a data breach and particularly if you've exposed people's personal data. Yeah, which kind of leads on to another question, I guess. I know, I mean, data breaches and ransomware have both been mentioned extensively throughout this conversation, but what what are there other threats that you you think that people should be preparing for? I mean, what are the most common things that you you think people are likely to run into from a crisis comm scenario? I mean, data breaches, Jonathan, you said are going to happen two or three times a year, so certainly that would be one. And we obviously know that ransomware is not going anywhere, but I'd be interested to hear what other kinds of sort of cyber associated crisis might be worth planning for at this stage, and how you might plan differently for those crises. What would change depending on the nature of the attack or the threat vector? Big question. Like business email compromise, where yeah. there there was a a report of one guy. I think uh, he fell for a whole whole setup where there were multiple people in a deep fake scenario, and mm. he ended up wiring a, a substantial amount of money to the entity that was requesting it. And in cases like that. You, you need to have an alternative secondary or tertiary um, activity in place or, or some verification process. Like if the somebody's trying to deep fake the CEO and, and tell you to send a million dollars to this entity, you need to be able to ask questions of that person that the, only that person would know and have mm -hmm. it worked out ahead of time for a, a scenario like that. You save yourself millions of dollars and fines mm -hmm. and trust. Reputational damage, et cetera. Yeah. Neil, I think you were about to say DDoS. Yeah, possibly. The, the other one, obviously, is denial of service. So when your whole service is taken out, like someone takes down your internet connectivity or, or your cloud connection, whatever, like takes you out, fully takes you out. I think that is something people need to be prepared for, particularly on a nation state basis. Like you... You may have seen what happened to Iran before they attacked Israel. All their banking system was taken down, so they didn't attack Israel. That's mm. that's the kind of scale of attacks that could occur. So if, if I was if I was a nation state and I was going to attack another country, I'd take out their banking system straight away because you're going to get civil unrest very quickly. If people can't buy food anymore, they're not going to be worried about fighting people anymore. They're going to mm -hmm. put hands up, you know. So that that kind of denial of service, it could be existential. If if you're a bank, you need to your cash points need to work. If you're if you're a retailer, your website needs to work, you know. So yeah. if you if you stop the website functioning, they can't sell their products. If you're a a current if you're a desk in a bank and you you're the equity desk and you're trading tens of billions a day, making hundreds of millions of profit, if your desk stops working for whatever reason, you'll soon pay up for whatever whatever it needs to be paid up to stop that service being mm. stopped, being denied. Yeah, makes sense. I think I think the other big threat that's increasing, and there's all sorts of, you know, you could do another webinar on why, but employee threat in, in, inside of rogue actors, there's, there's all sorts of factors leading that. You know, some people feel that they've been made to come back in the office post-pandemic. Some people have 
loyalties eroded a bit during the pandemic. We talked mm. about quiet quitting people, have a shorter tenure at corporations, et cetera, et cetera. There's normally some sort of grievance that triggers it from the cases I've been involved with. Sometimes it's relatively trivial, but I think organizations regrettably have to learn to trust their employees less. Yeah, well... That's a somber note to end on, but probably a sensible one. <laughs> I mean, that's really, I mean, it's been a very insightful conversation. So thank you all very, very much for joining. We're just running out of time now, so we will leave it there. But if there's any questions from any of our attendees that didn't manage to answer the question, please get in touch. All of our details can be found um, after the fact, and we'll be happy to, to get involved and, and help you out where we can. This webinar will be available on demand. We'll get that uploaded to the Escan PR website and on social media, et cetera, as soon as possible. And yeah, I'd just like to say thank you to all of our attendees and a massive thank you to all of our panelists for such a wonderful conversation. Pleasure, thanks. Thank you for organizing. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks. Take care, enjoy the rest of your days. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.